Uh, yeah, I've got a French name. I'm from Quebec originally, um, but I've been in New Zealand for 33 years. I didn't know anything about rugby when I moved there. But uh, boy, the rugby man in that nation. And the All Blacks are doing so well, why not? You know. Anyway, nice to be here. Is Kerry in the room? Um, lovely event. Thanks for inviting me again, uh, Kerry. Uh, I'm not going to be too uh, dramatic or uh, dark in my presentation, but I am, again, like other speakers, going to point out that we're in trouble. Our system, system's in trouble. doesn't mean that we have to be ourselves in trouble. But you know the system's in trouble when you have um, even central bankers coming out, like a couple of weeks ago, the Dutch central bank uh, coming out and saying, if the system collapses, what? <laughs> Central banker, why would he say that? Gold can serve as a basis to build it up again. Oh, wow. That's quite a, an admission. Coming. It's much better answer than Bernd Bernanke's answer to the question Ron Paul asked him. Why do central banks have gold? And he went, uh, uh, tradition? Uh, anyway, so <laughs> to, to go on, uh, the central bank of uh, Netherlands says gold bolsters confidence in the stability of central bank's balance sheet and creates a sense of security. Well, well, but right. we didn't know that, right? So this is not advice. You know, I'm a professional investment advisor. I hate doing this, but you know, I have to tell you, this is not advice. They asked me to tell you what I'm giving here is not advice. But if you want advice, you can always call me. Um, so. <laughs> In a nutshell, this is how I see um, the industry I, I work in. Uh, our fiat-based monetary system is failing, that's clear. The global financial system is fragile. Um, investing is more and more an act of faith, faith in the central bankers. It's the new religion, you know. Um, honest price discovery has been impaired. What do I mean? Interest rates are no longer true interest rates, therefore the price of everything is impaired because interest rates is the price of money. Normalization was tried for a while at the Fed, not the other central bankers, but they tried to call back that extra money that they printed um, earlier this year on QT, quantitative tightening. Um, and raise interest rates. There were, oh, there was, there was an, on, on autopilot, they were going to increase it for a quarter of a percent every uh, three months, and we'd go to three and a half percent. It all came to a grinding halt when, unfortunately, the markets were starting to collapse. So we're back to um, quantitative easing, but we're not calling it quantitative easing again. Uh, and uh, the new normal is negative interest rates. I mean, I'm an actuary by training, believe it or not, uh, as well as a financial advisor. And I, I studied financial mathematics ad infinitum. And uh, I can tell you, it, may, it does not compute. <laughs> and it, it don't make sense. But uh, that's what we have. And um, when a government uh, like even Switzerland, uh, but many other governments issues bonds with 30 year duration, I think Switzerland issued one of 50 years, uh, with a negative yield, people buy it. So I have more to say about that, uh, who those people are. Um, but uh, capitalism is dead. Sorry, bring you the bad news. <laughs> capitalism um, operated on the basis of savings and investments and capital. What we have today is creditism. Uh, it's a system based on credit, more and more and more credit. Because once we've delinked to goal the monetary system, the system is based on debt. And that is why debt keeps increasing. It, without the increase in debt, the system collapses. You could argue mathematically also that without the pace of increase in debt that we have, we wouldn't even have economic growth. So our growth today is funded uh, at the expense of our children and children's children. What the hell? What is this? <laughs> it's crazy, right? Is there a way out? Oh, yeah, there is. There is a way out. How dare you? Did you, did you see that? How dare you? 
The poor little thing, you know, she's her, this is the wrong target, Greta. Forget the politicians, you're not gonna achieve anything there. Why don't you focus on central banks? How dare they do what they do? It's gonna have far more impact on your life than climate change. So I say, how dare they? Central bankers, but not just central bankers, really. I've come to this conclusion because I operate in this industry and I'm quite frankly fed up with my colleagues. I'm thinking of quitting as an investment advisor, quite frankly, and doing a full-time bullion dealer. Um, because central bankers do crazy things, you know, negative interest rates, printing money. At the moment, the Fed is like injecting 120 US billion dollars a day for the big banks to make sure they have enough liquidity to survive to the next day. And they're doing this every day, and they've already committed to do it for another month, and they started another QE program that's called Not QE. And you would think this, that would, this would stop, this madness would stop. And the reason it doesn't stop, here's the bad news, here's the really bad news. It's not so much the central banks, it's investment advisors, I have to say investment advisors and fund managers. They're the reason why it carries on, because they don't care. They don't care. They're, they still invest the same way they invested 20 years ago. I gave a presentation last 10 days ago, 15th, in, in Wellington, to CFA charter holders like me. Um, in the room, there were fund managers, investment advisors. Even a couple of guys came from the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. They were very quiet, and they left the room at the end. <laughs> but, you know, they, they listen, uh, you know, but they don't know what gold is. They, you know, nobody learns about gold at university or in any program. You need to find out yourself. So the problem is that they continue operating with the same beliefs and, and trust. They have, you know, the, re, the new religion is central banking. You know, they're the high priests, we believe. Um, what is the prime belief of advisors is the belief that the U.S. Treasury, you know, that U.S. government debt paper is what they call risk-free. That's the risk-free asset. So that's the safe harbor they go to when they want the safest asset in the portfolio. Well, it's not anything but risk-free. I mean, the U.S. hasn't paid a dollar of their debt since 1961. More importantly, not only does it continue to go up, but there used to be a thing called the debt ceiling. Anyone here uh, never heard of the debt ceiling? Yeah, they, they will, there will be more and more people who never heard of it because they don't, they don't talk about it anymore. Yeah? It doesn't exist. It's been suppressed. They, uh, they defer it, you know, they defer it. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that right now. This chart is the most important chart of my presentation. I could just talk about this and then ask for questions. <laughs> but it's um, a chart from Nick Laird's uh, website, um, Gold Charts Are Us, excellent website. You know, you should all subscribe and Nick will send me some money. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it plots the rise of the U.S. federal government debt in red, and it plots you know, with the black uh, uh, steps alongside the debt ceiling uh, from 2000 to today. And what it shows is that up until when the crisis began, you know, it was, you know, same as usual, they would, you know, once the debt reached the ceiling, they would go to Congress and ask permission to borrow more, and the Congress would tell oh, you, okay, you know, so all right, right, increase the debt ceiling. They raised it 78 times, you know, so some ceiling. Um, but, you know, the crisis started, and um, they had to increase it more regularly. And, you know, there was, uh, in 2011, I don't know how many of you remember, but there was quite a debate in Congress about raising the debt ceiling again so much. And the world's attention was on the U.S. debt. That's when the U.S. lost its AAA credit rating. 
That's when gold went to, you know, you know what, 1900 or what. And, and you know, back then, the world's attention went on, was on the real problem. That all changed, of course, with increasing quantitative easing, increasing money going into the system with central banks issuing more money. So what the hell, you know, why, why pay attention to gold when, you know, there's gonna, the markets are going to do well for sure. We've got more and more money to, 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 to buy. Um, so the, the gold price, that's why I think the gold price went into the dog box for six years. Uh, but really, uh, the, the other reason is if you look at the arrows on the right-hand side of that chart, you will see that from 2012 on, uh, there was no talk about raising the debt ceiling before letting the debt rise. The debt rose above the debt ceiling. And once it rose so much above the debt ceiling, they all agreed to, well, let's increase the debt ceiling to where the debt has reached. I don't know what you call that. It's a debt floor, right? <laughs> anyway, so they've done it again this year. Um, and I don't think there was any coverage in the media about it. I think they probably had two or three congressmen on beach, or women from each side. And they said, yeah, let's, let's uh, suspend the debt ceiling again. And do you, uh, do you know until when they have? Take a guess. <laughs> no, that, that would be outrageous. Maybe next time. Don't, don't just even suggest it to them. No, but until beyond the next presidential election, until 2021. So that's going to be a hell of a big increase in the ceiling uh, when they have to address it, because uh, recession will probably start sometime next year or soon, and the US deficit is going to rise. At the moment, it's a little over $1 trillion. And you know what a trillion is? I mean. It's an it's unfathomable number. The best analogy I've come across is that if you were born the same day Jesus Christ was born, and obviously you're still alive today, so you've had 2,000 2, plus years to spend money, and if you've spent a million dollars a day, every day of your life, your 2,000 years, you still wouldn't have spent a trillion dollars. Hey, the US government just adds that to their deficit you know, in a year or less, no problem. Um, so um, the other important thing about this chart for this gold conference, in fact, is they look at the gold price. Sure, it overshoots. When everyone panics and loses faith in the dollar, the gold price goes up more rapidly than otherwise. Or when people don't care about, the gold, about gold anymore, the gold price falls. So the gold price overshoots and undershoots, but it follows the debt. What is the debt going to do? In the f over the it's going to rise. So the gold price is going to rise. It's a no-brainer. The gold price rises because the debt rises. And if the gold price continues to catch up, as it's doing now, to reach you know, what, where the debt is, it'll, to, if it was equal to the debt or you know, at, at the point that it would have to be to track the debt, it would be $1,800 an ounce. That gives you an inkling. It doesn't mean it should be. It just gives you an inkling of one way to gauge where the gold price is relative to where it should be. Here's another one. I mean, I'm asked all the time what the price should be. I really don't care about the price. I tell my clients, buy it, forget about it. Hoard it. You'll know when to spend it. You don't sell gold, you spend it. Here's another chart from Nick's website, basically showing that if you consider gold to be money, when it was part of the monetary system and there was 40% backing of gold to the monetary base, by the way, someone said yesterday that 100% backing under the gold, no, that never, that never happened. There was never 100% backing. I think there was. Someone, Murray Rothbard, wrote a book arguing that there should be, but no, there was never. It was 40% backing. And that's why the chart on the left-hand side, the gold price tracks that blue curve, because the blue curve is what the per capita um, amount of money there is. 40% uh, of uh, the amount of money per capita. 
And so today, that's about $4,000 US. So that's another way of measuring, you know, if gold was to be considered money or part of the monetary system, 4,000 would be a reasonable amount uh, for the gold price today. I'm not saying that it's what it should be. And, and you can do this kind of analysis or measurement using different monetary um, supply numbers, M1, M2. You can use it for, from a global monetary supply. You get different numbers and they're all higher. <laughs> well, that's why you get numbers like 10, 14, 52,000, whatever. So but that's if gold was part of the system again. Meanwhile, while it's not part of the system, you can buy it and you can hoard it. And it's pretty damn re rewarding. You know, it's not normal when the return you get from having a lump of metal sitting doing nothing is better than what you get from your fund manager or investment advisor. You've got 10, 10, the gold price performance on a calendar year basis across 10 currencies since 2001 till today. 2019 is year to date, and the gold price I use for that table is 1500 And as you can see, it's done pretty darn well this year so far. I mean, I know people wanted to continue to go up, but hey, you know, got to be reasonable here. 25% already this year. It's going to continue to go up, whether it does this year it'll, it, or not. It's, no, nobody knows. But on average, across currencies, it's 8.9% um, per annum compound return from not investing. But why would you invest? That's, that's a good question. Uh, Australian dollars hasn't been doing too badly. You know, $10,000 in gold 19 years ago would be worth $45,000 now. Here's a slide of Jim Rickards. Um, he and I were both uh, speaking at a BMG event back in 2012. BMG is the firm I use in Toronto for implementing bullion for clients. Um, and uh, he, I asked him permission. I have permission from Jim to use this slide. I, I like it because it, he, he said central banks think like fund managers and advisors. They, they think, Mark, the system is based on equilibrium theory. So, we're going to tweak interest rates a little bit down, a little bit up, you know, like adjusting the temperature with a thermostat, and we're going to control all this. Well, so far it's working, and I, you know, but uh, maybe the system is more like a nuclear reactor. <laughs> and I think Jim's quite right. Uh, in a nuclear reactor, nothing happens until you reach a critical threshold of something wrong, at which point Everything changes. There's meltdown. So here's a firm, Fasanara Capital. That's a chart I asked permission for. Um, somehow that it's different from my original. Anyway, um, it's all right. Uh, you can still see the whole chart. Basically, they argue that the systemic risk is not just the banking, the central bankers. It's also the funds, the fund managers. What it says is that 90% of investment strategies are trend-linked or volatility-linked. That might sound OK. You know, why not? Let's follow the trend. Well, 90%? <laughs> so there's, there's, there's potentially too high concentration of that approach to investing. Another way, place where there's a lot of con concentration means higher systemic risk. Concentration of risk in top 10 players. Top 10 fund managers back in 2017 had 22 trillion under management. It's probably 30 trillion now. So that's why central banks now and the Financial Stability Board headed by Mark Carney uh, say that fund managers, some of them are systemically important institutions now, not just the big banks like uh, JP Morgan. Um, but here's the one that really gets me is that 90% now of new flow into equity markets is passive. Now, passive is a good idea. Passive means you invest in an index fund. You don't really crack your brain to try to figure out which stocks are the best one to buy or which ones to sell. But you, you, you just track the index. When, if everyone does that, <laughs> the, the index is not very efficient. 
And, and the people who get the most capital or allocation of money are the big companies, not the small ones, the ones who probably deserve it more. So things to think about, systemic risk. What's the role of gold in all of this? Um, I say gold has a dual role. Why do I say that? Well, gold had a role as part of the system, as a numerator. It's not like in a gold standard, everyone walks around with gold in their pocket. Well, that's not what it means. It means that the money you have in your pocket is redeemable in gold at a fixed exchange rate. So gold is there to keep the amount of money in circulation honest. Why gold? Because it's the substance on this earth. Until we can go to Mars and find out what's there, it's better. Um, on this earth, it's the good that has the lowest diminishing marginal utility. What the hell does that mean? In economic terms, it means that they can produce 1,000 tons more next year, 4,000 tons more next year. It won't affect the amount of gold available. There's 60 times more gold above ground than what is produced annually. So it's that stock to flow ratio that gives gold its property to act as a measure of value. And that's the role of gold. But there's another role when it's not on the system, and that's for us to use gold to protect our purchasing power and give us the optionality of having the cash, gold as cash, when the time comes that it matters. So uh, just going back one, um, so the, the role for the system is dormant at the moment. It's not extinct like a volcano. It might erupt, it might come back at the day it's needed. If you go back to that quote from the Central Bank of uh, Netherlands, they know, central bankers know the system is doomed. It's going to fail. Fiat currencies always go to zero, and the whole world operates on the fiat currency. So they know this. So gold might play a role as part of the system sooner than we think. But the role for you is, is very much live. Now, I've got a couple of charts to finish off. Uh, the, this one and the next one are from uh, Incrementum friends, Ronnie and Mark there, and I think they're in Liechtenstein, but they're, Austri uh, they're Austrians, both of them. Um, and they write a fantastic report every year. It's called In Gold We Trust. Uh, and it's a zillion pages long. <laughs> it's very big. It's massive. But it's got lots of valuable charts and information. If you haven't seen it, just Google it. Incrementum is the firm In Gold We Trust. And these are a few, few charts from, from. So that's a chart that shows that gold has that high stock to flow ratio against any other. Well, there's a few there, but you can put all the commodities, everything that's uh, produced. Uh, stock to flow ratio is more like one year of stock for, for how much is produced annually. Silver is the exception. I mean, you know, I like silver. I have silver. I tell clients they should have silver as well as gold probably to sell silver when it's high to buy more gold more cheaply. But silver was used as money a lot in history, but today I don't think that would be possible. Certainly central bankers don't accumulate gold, uh, silver. Silver is industrially used. I think was, I, I'm not an expert on it, but I think it's certainly more than 50% of the annual production ends up being used industrially or some, some way or another. So it's not hoarded as much as gold is. So that's, you know, to show the, this slide is to show why gold can serve that role uh, in the system. The next slide shows why gold is ideally suited to serve, uh, to protect your purchasing power right now. Why do I say that? Because we have negative real interest rates. Whenever you have negative real interest rates, when rates are below the zero line, uh, gold does well. It makes sense. You know, if, um, if you're not earning a positive return with money in the bank in real terms, then of inflation, uh, you know, why not have gold, which won't cost you that much to store, and, uh, you know, it keeps uh, its purchasing power. So it did very well in the 70s for that reason. It didn't do well after that for a long period. The person to uh, blame for that or to credit for that is 
the tall two meter central banker of the time, Paul Volcker, cigar smoking, and um, the world was losing faith in the US dollar. That's why the gold price went to $850 an ounce. So he said, let's, let's let the interest rates go where they will. Imagine a central banker do that today. <laughs> it's unthinkable, the debt is too big. Back then, the US probably didn't even have $2 trillion of debt, 1980. So the interest rates went to double digits and very high, double, you know, 25%, I think, was the peak in the short end of the curve. And it went as high as 12 or 13% in the 30-year uh, bonds. So, hey, why the hell have gold if I can make, you know, 25% buying U.S. Treasuries? Uh, so, but it started moving up again in 2000, largely because interest rates became negative again in real terms. Central banks know this. They're buying gold more than they have, I wouldn't say ever, but certainly since the 60s. You have to go back to the 1960s to see central banks buying as much. And they're buying more and more. This year it's going to be a record year again. Why do they do that? Well, I think the Dutch bank uh, gave us an inkling of that a couple of weeks ago. So they know. But the people we should be angry about angry towards the fund managers, the investment advisors, I don't care. That, there's less than 1% of total financial assets allocated to gold still to this day. But you know, that wasn't the case in 1960 on this chart, but it, it, throughout the 60s, even the early 70s, I started working in the early 70s as an actuarial trainee and I could see that the pension funds I was advising, what their assets were, they all had some gold, you know, 5% or so. Um, that time might come again. And if it does, then you can watch that price go up like crazy, okay? Because there's not enough gold, really, at this price to meet that demand. So it's not rocket science, you know. Um, really not. You need to know about the history of money and that our system is collapsing. It, you know, it happened many times. What happens when it collapses is that wealth changes hands. It goes from the people who had all their wealth in financial assets to the people who have the cash, the right sort of cash, gold. That gives you the purchasing power, the optionality to buy things when they're much lower in price. And if you need help with buying gold, you can call me. <laughs> um, that's what I do. Thank you very much. Time for one question, maybe, or two? No? Yeah, you've still got three minutes. A lot of questions, great. All right. The euro? The euro is a fiat currency like any other currency. And here's the interesting thing about the euro for me. That doesn't have a very long history. It has 20 years history, or more or less. Um, like, I mean, like Bitcoin has 10 years. Euro has 20 years, it's twice, you know. But they're both young currencies. Um, here's the thing, the euro is the currency for the European Union, but that union is just monetary, it's not fiscal. Therefore, there's a high risk that there will be a division of the countries that stay on the euro to maintain the, uh, the euro law. And, and it, you can see it in Europe, and I don't know if you're aware, but people hoard euro notes that are issued by the German central bank. Because euros are issued by the French central bank, the German central bank, the Dutch, you know, they're not issued by the European central bank. So there's a, there's a way of knowing where, who issued the note, the letter, the first letter on it, or the first number, I don't know. But people know, people in the know who experienced Weimar Germany or things like that. And so uh, a 20 euro note whether it's issued by Portugal or by Germany, is, you know, has the same purchasing power in the market. So people spend the ones issued by Portugal and they hoard the ones issued by uh, Germany because they ex fully expect Germany to break away from the euro. Uh, I don't know if that's true, but that's one uh, manifestation of what's called Gresham's Law. You know, good money, you know, Goes, is not used, why use? Now, I, I see a lot, of more, a lot of people arguing that, you know, you could, now you can spend gold, you know, using digital gold, you know. Why would you want to spend it? 
Spend dollars, you know. <laughs> so, I, I, but I don't know. I mean, should it be a, a dollar forty uh, instead of the dollar ten or whatever that it is? I, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. But uh, European, um, the European central banks have now had negative interest rates for a very long time. Here's an, just to finish on that question, um, some people in, in the industry, smart people, argue that the system can carry on sim more or less because interest rates are still positive in the U.S. The minute the U.S. goes negative, I think that's, it goes poof. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Thanks, Louis. Okay, thanks. <laughs>